Hi, my name is Hui Cheng Song. I'm a software engineer working at Uber. Today, I'm going to share about our project of migrating a large number of high tables to Parquet. We're going to talk about uh, the motivation uh, behind this project. As a background, we're going to first introduce the data lake infrastructure at Uber. And then coming back, what are the challenges in this project? And how do we address those challenges? So our migration started last year, 2021. And in that year, we use a different approach. We uh, migrated over 100 tables and also have a lot of learnings. And this year, based on those learnings, we redesigned the tooling and achieved much better results. In the end, we're going to talk about uh, the improvement we plan to make in the near future. Uh, first, about uh, our motivations of migrating to Parquet. So you probably already know, Parquet is one of the most popular ball formats used in big data world. Uh, it divides data into row groups. And uh, within row group, the data are stored in a columnar fashion um, in pages. So this allows better compression uh, because similar data in the same columns are located together and that gives better compression ratio. It also supports better filter pushdown because now based on the column statistics, you can completely avoid reading uh, or decrypting, decompressing the column data. In Uber, Parquet is the format we choose and invest a lot. So the features include column level encryption and authorization and column pruning and uh, uh, optimized compression uh, transcoding. So that's one side of the motivation. Another part is uh, we do not want to carry over the cost of maintaining multiple file formats so in Uber because of historical reasons. We have a relatively large number of non parquet formats. About 20% uh, um, of those data are, are in ORC format and a small number of text format and Avro format, et cetera. Uh, recently we found, for example, uh, a bug that some queries are using deprecated HTTFS API. And after extensive troubleshooting, we find out it is some legacy ORC code using that API. So we have to fix those. That's just one example. Uh, maintaining multiple formats means operational cost, uh, doing bug fixes. And that's the motivation of why we want to get rid of majority of other formats of data files and convert to Parquet. So coming back, uh, we're first going to talk up a little bit of the data lake infrastructure at Uber uh, to set the background picture of this project. Uh, uh, this diagram is a very high level overview. Uh, in fact, it may not even be accurate. Uh, some, of those, some of the components are not here. And uh, uh, there are some interactions not drawn here. For example, uh, in some ETL job, some ETL jobs, uh, they may talk to microservices. But uh, this is just to give an uh, um, idea how the big data stack looks like. So in Uber, we rely a lot on Kafka uh, to pass along the messages across different components. In this case, we have online SQL, NoSQL databases, and they replicate data uh, through Kafka. We also have microservices, those serving uh, online requests, including uh, drivers, writers, uh, delivery, et cetera. Those data coming from Kafka get ingested mostly into Hive database. And the Hive database is uh, supported, it's backed up by HDF as well, mostly. Uh, some cases we do have S3, but currently those are just a small portion. 
And on top of that, we have ETL jobs. And that's using internal uh, ETL framework called Piper. So Piper is similar to Airflow. Inside the Piper job, uh, there can be different calls to Hive on Spark and Presto, and read data and transformation and write data out um, to Hive database or some other databases. But a majority of them do write to Hive databases. Uh, we have two data centers. So all those data are replicating between these two data centers. Uh, given this data infrastructure, uh, we are going to build a solution to transform the legacy of file formats to per K while um, these ETL jobs are still running. So next, uh, a little bit about the challenge, challenges we need to address. So if you look at a high table, it actually has two components, two major components. One, of course, is the data files. Those are non parquet uh, or parquet files, stores the actual data. But uh, as important one is the catalog file stored in high meta store. So we have uh, table level information and prediction level information that can include uh, schemas like the columns, data types, and the survey information uh, describing about uh, the file format information. And we also have uh, statistics uh, for query optimization. For example, number of files, uh, number of rows, uh, file sizes, et cetera. During our conversion, we need to uh, ensure all those data are consistent before and after conversion. So that's uh, super critical. And then we come to the challenges in terms of volume of data. So today we have over 100,000 number, 1,000 uh, hive tables, and 20% of those are in non parquet format. And uh, that's a large number of tables to migrate, so, which means we need to deliver a scalable solution. And then, uh, as you already see in the last slide, we have many. ETL jobs, uh, updating those tables. So very commonly, each table has a job uh, corresponding to it running nonstop. So we need to make sure during our migration, those jobs will not be impacted. And then finally, the migration does not only apply to data, to the data files and to the metadata, it also applies to the ETL jobs themselves. So those jobs need to be updated to reflect the format change. So to address those challenges, uh, we initially uh, build a solution, a simple solution based on a uh, Hive select insert. So that's very common solution, uh, works pretty well on smaller number a smaller data set uh, to address the large number of uh, hive tables with we chose a way to uh, crowdsource this meaning we generated uh, etl jobs for each table and uh, let the table owner to run those jobs because otherwise uh, it's still very challenging for our smaller uh, team to migrate all those tables. And our hope had been these table owners can uh, do a few clicks from our uh, ETL service, Piper, from the UI. And then they, they are going to migrate these tables uh, themselves. But we found uh, uh, there are a couple of issues with that approach. Uh, first, uh, the Hive Slack insert may not be uh, may not be safe. Uh, we we saw a potential data loss issue, so this can happen uh, if there is a mismatch between the Hive schema and the underlying data files. So if somehow a field uh, in data file is not exposed 
via the Hive schema. So Hive select will uh, leave out those data and the newly created files will no longer have those, uh, have those fields. Uh, this only happens to a smaller number of tables, but at the same time, because we do not know the importance of those hidden columns. So it's, it can be dangerous for us to just uh, blindly ignore those data. So that's a data loss issue. And then uh, at a, if we do this at, with a simple hive uh, select and insert, we found some tables uh, cannot be processed properly. Uh, for example, uh, we saw some data sources, some data hive tables uh, uses, a uses a map uh, with null uh, as keys. So such data cannot be even encoded into Parquet. And in fact, uh, it is used as a placeholder. It has no real meaning. So, but this cannot be fixed by a Hive select insert directly. We need a lower level uh, data manipulation uh, method to address, to address those particular uh, data source issues. And then uh, with a Hive select insert, we also found uh, after the conversion, some user experienced pipeline errors. And the reason for that is because uh, many tables have complex ETL patterns, uh, uh, complex update patterns. For example, some tables are using, uh, using uh, updated DFS directory outside, outside the table. So if we just uh, convert the table itself, and then those uh, data files created outside the table have mismatch formats, that will cause job failure. And finally, uh, we found this cross-sourcing does not really uh, work very well. Uh, many times, the partner team who owns data do not have the expertise to make such changes. And uh, they are hesitant uh, to work on this. So in the end, we saw only 100 tables uh, getting converted from this, uh, this effort. So based on the learnings, uh, we designed this year a different approach. Uh, we call it a migration V2. This is a multiple pillar approach first uh, to address the data safety issues. We develop a lower level of file-based rewriter. So instead of using Hive select insert or something similar uh, at other query engine, so we use a low level file-based record by record uh, transcoding. So this guarantees uh, data safety and efficiency. And then to allow uh, zero downtime migration, we need to make sure during our migration queries uh, from other uh, people can still access the data without a problem. And for that, we introduced uh, mixed format support. So meaning, uh, during our migration, uh, you can see different partitions may have different formats. So some query engine by default do not handle that well. And uh, we patch uh, those query engines and uh, fully support it. And then finally, uh, this is about the ETL job migration. So with file-based writer and a mixed format support, suppose if a table is not being updated, and then uh, we do not have any problem. But uh, as we talked about earlier, uh, there can be over 100,000 ETL jobs uh, manipulating the data. So this job migration means we change the, these ETL jobs to make sure uh, during migration, there are no conflicts and uh, new data are being uh, created using Parquet format. And finally, even uh, with those three uh, pillars, we're still dealing with too many tables. Like earlier I mentioned, there can be 20,000 non-parquet files to be converted. 
So in currently, we prioritize to tier one and tier two data sets, which has about 1,000 tables. And uh, currently, we converted uh, over 500 tables. And uh, we're going to finish 1,000 tables in a short long time. And then uh, based on the learnings in this phase, we plan to automate this process to scale out to all those uh, 2,000 tables. And next, we're going to dig a bit deeper to each of those uh, three uh, pillars, uh, the file-based rewriter and mixed format support and the job migration. So for the rewriter, uh, it, is, it can be a bit challenging uh, to create from scratch, especially to handle different uh, types like uh, structures, arrays, maps, uh, daytime, et cetera. So we chose to reuse the Spark data source. The reason we use Spark is because uh, Spark is one of the most popular used query engines. And uh, we have a, a lot of expertise uh, from team members uh, around Spark. And also because Spark has many built-in data sources, classes, utilities we can leverage. Internally, uh, Spark represents a role as an uh, internal role data structure. So it will translate between that internal representation and uh, the external data sources of different formats like tax or RC per K, et cetera. So, but uh, to call out our writer, even though it's based on Spark, it's different from using higher level query uh, query uh, primitive. We're not using Spark SQL. We're not using data frame or data set. Uh, we're just using these low level classes directly. Uh, basically, we call the uh, data sources uh, as input and read it row by row. And then we write these rows out to per K. So the workflow within the rewriter uh, is basically uh, we rewrite the data uh, to convert to parquet format, save it to some staging location, and then we run validation, uh, do the checksum and row counts before and after the rewrites. So if everything matches, and then we swap the location of the staging and the production directory, and then we update the HMS format uh, to parquet. And we're going to talk a little bit about the specific uh, interesting problem we solved uh, while we developed the rewriter. So one thing is we found out there are some legacy RC files. Uh, they do not have embedded schema. So normally uh, ORC and Parquet, uh, they have their own copy of schema embedded within each file. And these should match to the HMS schema at the position or table level. But in some cases, we found uh, ORC only has anonymous rows, anonymous columns. Uh, it's called underscore column zero, underscore column one, et cetera. And uh, before we just use, before finding this, we just use a file uh, translation directly. But to support transcoding uh, such files, so we have to consult to the external schema coming from a uh, high meta store and use that as parquet schema. Another issue is about the Spark time spent resolution. So if we, when we use internal row and uh, read from external sources uh, like ORC and uh, write it to parquet, and we found out uh, the timestamp checksum can be mismatched. The reason for that is because Spark internally uh, only has microsecond level resolution for timestamp, even though the data source itself supports nanoseconds. So this will truncate uh, the nanosecond component. So from practical uh, point of view, maybe this is not uh, a big issue. But uh, because we do not really understand the semantics of those data, so we have to make sure 
the data is requ semantically equivalent before and after a conversion. Now, how do we address this issue? So there is no way you can store this in internal role without losing, without losing the res resolution. So what we did is we create this uh, side channel. We store the actual timestamp in a temporary data structure. And within the internal role, we just store a pointer pointing back to these actual timestamps. And when we write this to Parquet, uh, we do a lookup if it is a timestamp to fetch the real timestamp with a nanosecond. And the last uh, example I want to share is uh, the map tab hash. So from the conversion workflow, you can see it's a three step mostly uh, from rewrite to validation to swap. And during the validation step, we found uh, Spark will throw an error uh, on the map type because the map type checksum can be non-deterministic. And there is an option to allow uh, using checksum on hash uh, or hash over map type. But if you would do that, uh, the result is still non-deterministic. The reason for that is because the hash function used in Spark over map uh, enumerates over the key value pairs and calculate the sum um, based on the previous sum results from the key values. But for map type, the order of the key value pairs is not deterministic. And to address that, we have to create a private Spark build and uh, borrow the implementation from Hive. So basically, uh, we do not accumulate uh, the sum results from the previous from the previous uh, uh, key value pairs. So the checksum does not depend on order. This aligns with the Hive uh, hash function implementation. So even with all those problems solved. We still have issues that do not have good solution at the moment, uh, which we put this under known issues. Uh, here are just a few examples. So one example is the Hive merge uh, slowness. For RSC format, we found out Hive has certain optimization. The merge is not done uh, at a record at, by record level. But for uh, Parquet, and there is no such optimization. Uh, this results in slowness after the migration. Uh, our solution is to, um, originally we thought about build this parquet optimization into Hive, but decided against that uh, due to call, um, the ROI, uh, low ROI. So our solution is to uh, detect the slowness of all those potential tables before we do migration. And if we decided this is, if this is above certain threshold, we just ignore those tables. Unfortunately, fortunately, there isn't uh, that many tables having this uh, issue, significant slowness. Uh, about only, about only 1% um, of tables get excluded by this. And we're going to address those tables later on. Uh, after we finish majority of the uh, table migration. And the next issue is the ordering of the strings after migration. We found uh, before, uh, migra before the conversion, after conversion, the minimum and maximum of string values can be different. So further investigation found that for ORC, for some ORC tables, they are, they are using uh, Unicode in strings and they have uh, international characters that beyond uh, above a certain Unicode threshold. And the Java Unicode used in ORC sorting has problems supporting the ordering. So it's just using UTF-16 and the direct binary order. But the binary representation of UTF-16 does not uh, reflect 
the UTF code point value. So this is a known issue. Uh, we choose we we just ignore it in the validation. And then uh, finally, we found this uh, validation error due to ORC positive negative zero issue. So in ORC far from it, it stores data in stripes and read it in batches. Uh, one optimization in ORC is it finds that all the data in the same batch are equal, then it would only store uh, one value to represent the entire batch. But that does, does not work well with this negative and positive zero uh, floating point value. From RC point of view, positive zero and negative zero is the same within the same batch. But when we do checksum, we do binary comparison, positive zero and negative zero are do not have do not have the uh, the same value. So our workaround for this is we use a larger uh, batch size, so that significantly reduce the chance of one batch having uh, the having only positive negative zero. Uh, it has other value. Then in this case, ORC will skip uh, such optimization. And for only for the remaining a few tables uh, cannot be addressed this way. Uh, we just manually ignore a checksum over such cables. Okay, so those are the work we did with the file level rewriter. And next, we're going to talk about uh, mixed format support. So the reason for mixed format support is we want uh, incremental uh, rewrites happening while the table is still uh, being queried. And so the basic read uh, will not have downtime. And the reason we want incremental rewrites is because uh, many times for large tables, we cannot afford to convert the entire table altogether. So we have to uh, convert partition by partition without downtime. And the mixed format is to address that problem. Uh, what we did is we investigated uh, the three popular query engines using Uber, uh, Hive, Spark, and Presto. Uh, we tested uh, what's their behavior given mixed format uh, configuration over a table. We found um, Presto works out of the box, but Spark and Hive uh, will have issues. Uh, in, in the case of Hive, the problem is uh, it does not handle uh, mixed format when uh, there's a third-day mismatch. So our solution is to update the Hive code and to force it to use the third day from the prediction instead of from the table. Uh, for Spark, the issue is because by default, uh, Spark uses its native uh, data source uh, that for ORC and per K. So it will assume the prediction level will have the same format as the table level. This is an optimization done in Spark. But this prevents Spark to uh, read data at the prediction level that is different from the table level. So what we did is uh, we introduced a table level property. And when Spark detects this, we force it to use a Hadoop RDD. It's a different data source, uh, which respects the prediction level file formats. Uh, also, we found uh, even for Spark, with this data source, it seems to be not a well-tested uh, scenario. In some branches, uh, this does not work, uh, having a regression. So we have to cherry pick it from uh, the latest branch and to our internal branches. Uh, given these optimizations of patches in query engines, we still found uh, there can be uh, transient issues. 
uh, it, ha it can happen, or for example, during the conversion, when the query engine uh, kicks in uh, to run a query, it reads the, it scans the relevant predictions, get the formats, but haven't uh, actually read data yet. And at this time, we finished the uh, converting certain tables and updated the data, the files, and the formats. Uh, at this time, the query engine kicks in and read data files. It will find the data file has a different format than what it believes it is in the prediction information uh, read earlier. This only happens for a very small number of queries that scans a large number of tables. Uh, we, we investigate this and uh, there can be a mitigation that we preserve the old HDFS path during conversion, but write it to a different path. And uh, only after a while, uh, to suppose all the query, suppose all the queries are done uh, over the old path, and then we swap, we repoint uh, the HMS direct uh, HMS location to the new location and update the format. This is a kind of a snapshot isolation, but also it comes with its own problem. So the issue is many pipelines do have assumptions of their location path. For example, some pipelines will add a uh, date time stamp uh, to the path. If we change that, that can break those pipelines. And also there are some high features uh, depending on uh, assumed HDFS locations. For example, um, Hive MSZK commands, it scans all the data files under the table and it rebuilds the HMS partitions. So if we choose the non-default path, that will break this feature. So in the end, uh, we decide against uh, using this mitigation and uh, take this as uh, uh, treat this as a known issue and communicate this with table owners uh, before conversion. So this is uh, the mixed format. Uh, that's how we support. That's how we support uh, read during the conversion. Next, we're going to talk about uh, how do we support write uh, during the conversion. Uh, write meaning the ETL jobs updating the data while we are working, uh, converting the, converting the uh, table and files. So the ETL job uh, has two major components relevant to our uh, Hive to Parquet migration. So one is the DDL, one is DML. DDL means uh, how it creates the table. And uh, DML means how it updates the data. So for the DDL patterns, um, we found there can be three major categories. Uh, one is uh, create a table outside the job, meaning within the job, there's really no DDL running. Uh, another category uh, most common is using create a table if not exists. So that's a high statement. So if a table already there, then it will bypass table creation. And uh, there's also a category which is less common, uh, but do exist. Uh, it's first dropping a table and then recreated completely. So we need to uh, address this differently uh, in the pipeline conversion. And coming to the DML, the most common way for the pipelines to update table is using either uh, using a insert statement either in Hive or Spark or Presto. But there are also um, many uh, pipelines or jobs. They first create data uh, to certain HDFS uh, directory, and then they update the HMS location pointing to those directories. So these require a different strategy to convert than the common insert pattern. And finally, 
there are uh, actually many uh, creative ways for the table owner to update their, their data in their pipelines. Uh, one example, we call this a dual table pipeline, uh, meaning after they create this data, they use another table, uh, hive table, and they create partitions pointing back uh, to the same DFS directory. So this will create an interesting usage. The same directory is pointed by two hive tables. So again, this requires special treatment uh, during the conversion. So in the end, uh, our strategy is to detect all those different configurations based on both source code analysis and uh, audit information, audit logs from query engines from an ETL uh, framework. So for example, in the case of uh, insert, uh, insert DML pattern, we just uh, uh, update the table format without changing the source code, rewrite the data, and then uh, we can create a task to let the table owner to up their, update their uh, file format in their pipelines. And uh, in the case of swap location pipelines, so we have to first update the staging table format, because that's how the table format is decided when the data is first generated. And in, uh, in case of those special pipelines, like the dual table pipeline, uh, we have to handle them separately. In this case, we have to uh, first rewrite the data and then update both uh, table, both the uh, source table and the external table together to change their uh, format. Uh, we have internally developed a flowchart that are based on different combinations of these patterns and created different steps to handle the conversion of this pipeline. Yeah, so yeah, to summarize, uh, we talk about how we use a three pillar approach uh, to efficiently and uh, safely convert data. That includes a low level file rewriter and uh, um, pipeline conversion. And uh, um, so we're going to talk about the future work a little bit, uh, like we mentioned before. Uh, currently, we work on only 1,000 tables, uh, but we actually have over 20,000 tables. So this requires uh, better automation. So at the moment, we convert each table most, mostly based on one click. Now we want to that automation to even remove that one click, completely uh, automate the, the remaining of the tables. And then because we need to deal with a larger number of tables, it's more important for us to optimize the efficiency of the rewriter. So our current rewriter, uh, like we mentioned above, have rewrite validation and then conversion. What we found is uh, many times the Spark worker executor are not fully utilized in terms of IO or CPU. So that's another direction we want to uh, approve. Um, yeah, thank you.